All right, here we go. So good morning again, and uh, what a joy to be with you, and I'm so happy and honored to see this coming to uh, fruition after many talks, uh, many Skype talks uh, with uh, the team uh, leading this uh, initiative. Uh, we're so pleased to see Christ at the checkpoint going uh, global now, uh, a message that we believe needs to be heard in different parts uh, of the world. One of the things we always say to people who ask us what should we do, and I always say, well, give us a platform, uh, magnify our voices, uh, and we're so grateful for this opportunity. And believe me, uh, we do not take it for granted, uh, because many times we are not even given this uh, opportunity. Uh, and on a personal level, I'm also pleased, uh, as a director of Christ at the Checkpoint, I always, in, in Bethlehem, I always limit speakers to 22 minutes. But Daryl was, and the team were gracious enough to give me 45 minutes. So this is not something we get back home. So I'm happy to, to have the time to share with you about uh, the experience of being a Palestinian Christian uh, theologian and pastor uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, what does it mean to live out uh, our faith uh, in such a difficult uh, place? Um, and yes, I am a Palestinian Christian. And yes, we do exist. Uh, Many times people are surprised to know that we do exist. And I always say it will be a surprise if we did not exist because Jesus was born uh, in Bethlehem, the real Bethlehem, by the way, not the one in Pennsylvania. I studied in Pennsylvania and many times I got that impression that people thought that. Uh, we exist and uh, uh, we did not convert recently. We are not invented as some Americans or others would say about our Palestinian identity. We have always been part of the Holy Land as a Christian community with different times, different identities, and so on. At times we were a majority, at times we were, right now we are a tiny minority uh, from a religious perspective. Uh, and many are surprised to know that there are Arab Christians. And I always say, uh, you, you, when, whenever you hear the word Arab, uh, re just remember that Arab Christianity actually predates Islam. There were Arab Christians even before uh, uh, Islam. So think of that, and Arab theologians, and Arab uh, faith, and so on. Um, yet today, uh, we uh, are facing very difficult uh, situation uh, in terms of our uh, everything that surrounds us. There is a big decline in our number, as you all uh, know. Immigration is by far uh, the single biggest challenge we face as a community today. Uh, as a pastor, this is the my biggest fear, and I look at many of the families in my church, many of them, their children uh, uh, left. Uh, in recent meetings as Palestinian Christian leaders, the former Latin patriarch in Jerusalem, Michel Sapah, uh, used the, the word, we have reached the moment of impossible as a Palestinian people and also as a Palestinian Christians. Uh, we lost almost all hope in human uh, initiatives, and we only believe now uh, God has to do something uh, if things are uh, to change. As Christians, we are going through many, many uh, and very, very serious existential challenges uh, to the extent that we are now asking, will there be a future for Christianity uh, in, uh, in the Holy Land? Um, a lot of these stories and a lot of the insights I will share today are part of my experience, not just as a teacher and academic dean at Bethlehem Bible College, but also as pastor uh, in, uh, in Bethlehem. And usually I talk about four uh, challenges that uh, we face as Palestinian Christians uh, in uh, our land uh, today. Uh, political challenges that have to do with the reality of the occupation, uh, also very closely related to that economical uh, challenges. Unemployment is very high, especially uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, there are also socio-religious uh, challenges. Uh, we're beginning to see many younger generation adopting the, uh, mentality, the minority complex, thinking now, what future do we have uh, in this land? Uh, and fourthly, and uh, today uh, we are meeting in this context, uh, challenges that are relating to Christian attitudes toward the conflict, towards Israel, and towards us as uh, Palestinians. So let me quickly unpack these uh, four challenges and then uh, I will speak directly to the crowd here uh, with a message of hope, I hope, and a challenge uh, to you. Uh, when it comes to the political reality, 
um, we don't have time to really talk in detail about what does it mean to live under occupation. Uh, and I don't want to give a lesson in the history of the conflict or so, but what I want to emphasize is that the occupation touches every aspect of our lives. And these are the things that you do not get in the news. Uh, issues related, for example, to restriction of movement. How difficult it is to go from one Palestinian city uh, to the other, where before we leave, we have to go to the on to online Facebook pages and check the status of the checkpoint. Is it worth it to leave now, or will we be delayed at checkpoints? Is there another checkpoint that was just installed uh, that we didn't know about? This is kind of daily life. Uh, issues related to uh, water, issues related to uh, uh, even family uh, reunification. Uh, our reality is defined, our vocabulary uh, is defined by these uh, realities, occupation, separation wall, uh, checkpoints, settlements. You know, we talk about the problem of settlements. Settlements are built on our land. Uh, sometimes, you know, land that we've owned for years and uh, farmed for years, and then all of a sudden you wake up and there's a, uh, something about confiscating it. Uh, and just to give an example, again, uh, from about the injustices, here are some stories uh, that are in, in my congregation, in my small congregation, uh, in Bethlehem. Water is a challenge to all of us. In summer, sometimes we have up to four weeks without running water in our homes. Just think of that, the logic of that. And we look from our window to an Israeli Jewish settlement. They have swimming pool and green areas, and they're taking water from uh, the West Bank. And you think, what is the logic behind that? Is this related to security? How is that related to security as we always uh, hear? It's just plain unjust. Uh, and I can talk about uh, another a family who's just fighting to keep their land. Israel wants to confiscate uh, their farm to build a settlement uh, on it. Uh, and uh, it was mentioned this morning, uh, the Nassar family, it was just mentioned yesterday, the Nassar family story and they, their story of the tent of nations. Uh, the family, you know, literally wakes up every morning with the fear that they will lose their farm. And this is kind of uh, another uh, challenge. I can talk about family reunification. One of our church members, left the country, he's actually a colleague at the Bible College, because he couldn't get his wife a visa. Just think of the logic. A Palestinian who's been living in Bethlehem all his life, his family is from the original families in Bethlehem. He married someone from outside. Israel wouldn't grant them a visa to, to live in Bethlehem. Yet we have to watch every other time uh, uh, new Jewish immigrants coming to our land, and all of a sudden, it's their homeland, they have more rights in our land, yet we can't bring our spouses. Just think of the logic of that, the family uh, reunification uh, issues. And I can talk more about uh, humiliation and checkpoints, uh, the issue of Jerusalem ID. I have another family in church. Uh, the man is married to his spouse, uh, his wife is from Jerusalem. Uh, and it's their life is a daily struggle just to keep their right to live in Jerusalem, to have Jerusalem uh, residency. In addition to all of that, and this is just about, uh, and, and please remember that, as I said, related to the political challenges is uh, many uh, economical challenges. Uh, the fact that unemployment is so high, uh, especially, uh, you will be surprised, the highest number of unemployment after Gaza is in Bethlehem, uh, due to the fact that we depend a lot on tourism and tourism is unstable. Uh, the second set of, uh, challenge I, I would address is the socio-religious challenge. Uh, remember that our numbers are now, now in decline as a community, and we are no longer 5%, 4%, or 3 or even 2 In the Palestinian side, our numbers are now 1%. Uh, percent. Uh, and there is a slow and, uh, you know, we're seeing family after family uh, leave. And those who wish to return are not able to leave. Just keep that in mind. Uh, in addition to that, so now we're 1%, we're seeing also a slow and gradual change in the fabric of the Arab and Palestinian uh, society. Uh, the kind of society we grew up in was very secular when it comes to uh, view of life and view of religion. Uh, but we're beginning to see, as I said, a slow and gradual shift in which uh, the Palestinian society is, is becoming more uh, religious. And when you are a 1% minority, you're beginning to think, uh, how is that going to affect my uh, future? 
And I say here, which Islam will prefer? This is a question many Christians today uh, ask, because the Islam I grew up with is, is, is very, uh, you know, I know of many Muslims who were baptized as children because of the friendship they had with their Christian neighbors. This was very common in Palestinian villages uh, and towns. My best friends in university were Muslims. But we're beginning to see that this is now gradually uh, changing. Uh, we live in a polarized world, if you know what I mean. And, and uh, when you are uh, three Christian students in a uh, classroom with 30 Muslims, uh, you know, you begin to feel insecure. And this is what I meant by the minority complex. That's we're beginning to fight strongly as Christian leaders today uh, in, uh, in Palestine. Now, despite all of that, uh, those who visit will realize that the Palestinian Christian community is, in fact, a very active community. Uh, we are an integral part of our uh, society. Uh, and we are contributing in all aspects uh, of life. Uh, politicians are, are Christians. In the education, for many years, the best school were Christian schools. Uh, in the medical services, in the cultural center, in the literature and social, and I can tell many stories about that. Uh, a study in 2009 found out that one-third of the healthcare centers in the West Bank are Christians. Just think of that. We are 1% yet contributing to one-third of the healthcare centers. 45% uh, of all uh, non-governmental organizations are church-related or church uh, funded uh, organization related to development, to charity, to trainings, uh, and so on. And today we have 10 Christian mayors, uh, including the mayor of Bethlehem, where we are about 25%, and the mayor of Ramallah, because the Palestinian Authority has a law which says in 10 Palestinian towns and cities where historically uh, there was a more Christian presence there, the mayor has to be uh, a Christian. Ramallah, where Christians are less than 5%, uh, the mayor is uh, a Christian. So we are contributing, uh, and one of the things that I hope uh, you see uh, and uh, we want our influences in our theology, one of our, I think, one of our most important contributions today is in our uh, theology. Uh, a theology that uh, we have been writing and talking and quote unquote theologizing for many years now, uh, since the beginning of the Nakba, 1948, a response to what happened to us? Questions about where was God when this happened? Why did this happen to us? Uh, questions about the Intifada, Intifada, the uprising. Uh, should we throw rocks? Should we participate in these demonstrations uh, or not? We've been asking these questions about justice. Uh, many people like to put us in labels, so people label us uh, liberation uh, theology. But we like to think of ourselves just uh, people writing about our lives and about our Existence. And today uh, you will hear many quotes from Palestinian uh, theologians. Uh, Palestinian theology, when you read for uh, and when you listen and talk to Palestinian Christian leaders, uh, you know, here are some of the things you will read. It's, it's a contextual theology. In other words, I always say we do not have the luxury of writing theology in uh, libraries. We write theology at the checkpoint, uh, we write theology in our farm. Uh, it's, it's, it is a, it is a, it, it's trying to make sense of what is really happening with us. By the way, this is how we came up with the title, Christ at the Checkpoint. Since Alex came with this. The idea of trying to have a conversation with our reality, symbolized by the checkpoint, and our faith, symbolized by Christ, the center uh, of our faith. For us, justice is central for reasons that I've just shared. Uh, because we feel we live in a reality of injustice. So when you read for Palestinian Christians, you will see this big emphasis on justice. Uh, you will also see a big emphasis on promoting nonviolence or what we call creative resistance. Uh, resisting in a way that honors God, resisting the evil of the occupation in a way that honors God. In addition, we, you will see that we are uh, always challenging the theology of Christian Zionism. And I will speak more uh, later about this uh, and challenging more than Christian Zionism, the bigger umbrella, uh, the empire that allows such theologies uh, to, to flourish. And uh, also, what I want to speak about today is, if you remember, I put certain challenges, political, economical, socio-religious, and one of the biggest challenges we face today, uh, a challenge that even poses serious threat to our existence in the land, is in Western attitudes towards the situation 
towards uh, the conflict. We are, as I always say, writing and speaking today out of hurt and pain. We have been hurt in many ways, uh, and uh, whenever we try to, many times, most of the times, when we turn for comfort for our sisters and brothers around the world, rather than receiving comfort, uh, we receive uh, hurt uh, and pain. Our experience has been hurtful. Uh, think of the uh, Nakba, 1948. Um, when Israel was uh, created uh, as a state, uh, and many celebrated the creation of Israel as a miracle of God, as a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people. At the same time, when Israel was created, uh, around 530 Palestinian towns and villages were completely destroyed. Uh, around 800,000 Palestinians became uh, refugees. Some even today go higher than that. Um, today, they number more than 5 million. And we lost more than about 78% of our historic land, and thousands were killed. Uh, yet all of that was celebrated uh, as a miracle, as a sign of a divine uh, miracle. Uh, and you think, what about us? Where do we fit in this uh, miracle? When it comes to uh, Christians and Israel, This is what we often read or hear. And here are real quotes that I've collected over the years from Christians about the situation back home. We were often told that uh, the Abrahamic covenant continues with the Jewish people today and by extension with the state of Israel. Something that is very common in many Christian circles. And before debating the theological legitimacy of such a statement, at least the first part, Try to imagine how a Palestinian reads such a statement. Where do I fit in this? What does this mean? What are the implications for me as a Palestinian if this sentence is true? Uh, the fact that Israel is in covenant with God today. Uh, I'm talking about the modern state of Israel, at least. The creation of Israel in 1948 is viewed by many as a fulfillment of prophecy and is viewed by many others in documents as, as I said, a sign of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people. And if the creation of Israel is a sign of faithfulness to the Jewish people, it's a sign of what to the Palestinian people? You see what I'm trying to communicate here? What is this sentence communicating to me as uh, a Palestinian? Is God judging us? Is God against us? The God we encounter in the Bible, remember that. Um, and you might think, Here's the issue here, is that we are invisible in these statements. We do not exist. Uh, it's as if we do not exist when people say uh, these things. Uh, they treat the land, as I always say, as if it's empty. They treat the land as if uh, it's empty. As if God 2,000 years remembered his covenant with the Jewish people and brought them back to an empty land. And we wonder, hello, we just happen to be living here. What, what does this mean to us? Uh, another thing that we always hear about the conflict, uh, if you bless Israel, God will bless you. Uh, and if you stand against Israel, God will curse you. I've heard this from many pastors, from many theologians, and also from many politicians, uh, from Congress members, and, and so on. Uh, and they base this on Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Uh, and again, before debating whether this is we can justify this from the Bible. Just think of the logic of why people then support Israel. It's because they want God to bless them. It's not because they actually love the Jewish people. Uh, and because they want to avoid God's judgment on them. And for me, this is, and, and let's, let's say what it is. This is manipulation. You're manipulating people to support Israel so that you get God's blessing. And if you don't, you see what's happening, how the Bible uh, is used uh, today. God gave the land to the Jewish people as an eternal possession. Jews have a divine right to the land today. This is another common statement. And I, again, I wonder, what about us Palestinians? How, do, how should we react when the Bible is used in such a way against us? Because what these sentences, in effect, communicate is simple. God is uh, against you as a Palestinian. And no surprise that many times people told us, you should leave. Uh, you should leave uh, the land. And in the North American context, Christian Zionism is a strong movement. 
Uh, we're not talking about a uh, small community of Christians who support this. We're talking about a very strong lobby. Uh, uh, Stephen Sizer in his book mentions six uh, things Christian Zionists do uh, support the state of Israel, support and finance Jewish immigration, uh, support the settlements, uh, oppose the division of Jerusalem. Uh, we've seen this manifested in the last declaration by the American government about uh, Jerusalem. Some of them support the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, and most of them oppose uh, the peace uh, process. Uh, in 2015, there was a study by uh, an uh, Israeli human rights organization called MOLAD, the Center for Renewal uh, of Israeli Democracy, about Christian Zionism. It's in Hebrew, but the findings are summarized in English. You can look at uh, online about the dangerous allies, uh, emerging alliance between U.S. Christian right-wing and Israeli right-wing harmful to Israel. And what's interesting when you read this report, it's prior to the Trump administration and the recent uh, alliance between uh, support of evangelicals and what they, what they did uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. And it was all foreseen uh, in this uh, report uh, in which they talk, as I said, about a strong relationship developing between Christian Zionist and right-wing Israeli politicians. And I'm reading uh, now from the findings, Christian Zionist groups also heavily fund Israeli settlements in the West Bank, providing tens of millions of US dollars in recent years for projects in settlements, including illegal outposts. Of course, for them, there are legal and illegal outposts. I don't know how they see that. Uh, and for Jewish movements working to build a third temple. And whenever I read this, this breaks my heart. Tens of millions of dollars goes from American churches to fund settlements. In the same time when Christianity is surviving just to stay and to exist in Palestine. Just think of the logic behind that. Palestinian Christians are losing their farm. Palestinians in general are losing their, their land. And it's funded by churches. Just think of the logic of that and think how is that received by the Palestinian uh, community. Um, and today, uh, what we are saying is that this group is becoming mainstream. Uh, uh, it's in politicians, it's in the support that Trump uh, received uh, in the election from evangelicals. In 2016, a survey found out that 80% of American pastors respond with a yes uh, to the question, should Christians support Israel? And people concerned when we have Christ at the checkpoint, 80% uh, of American pastors say we should support uh, Israel. These are headlines from Israeli newspapers, by the way. Uh, about the evangelical support uh, and how they bankroll uh, Israeli uh, settlements. Uh, and it's not just in, the, in, in America. This year, uh, millions, millions of Brazilians hail Israel during March for Jesus. Again, just pause for a minute and think how I as a Palestinian, a Palestinian Christian, think my sisters and brothers taking strong one-sided in, in a March for Jesus out of all things. Uh, and as I said today, this is becoming uh, mainstream. Just I, I chose some headlines uh, from different uh, newspapers, uh, how everyone is talking about the evangelical support, uh, not just to Trump, but how uh, it was key in uh, Trump's decision to move the embassy uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Half of evangelicals support Israel because they believe it is important for fulfilling end time prophecy. Again, priorities and motivation uh, is clear here. Uh, a visit by uh, Michelle Bachman uh, to, uh, to uh, our land in which she mentioned how we should bless Israel because those who bless Israel will be blessed, she explained. And this is why she's visiting uh, and other. Uh, and uh, in the logic of that, as I always say, we as Palestinians uh, and speaking more directly to the context of this conference, we as Palestinian Christians, uh, when it comes to Western attitudes toward our conflict, toward our land, towards Israel, we feel that we are ignored at best and dehumanized at worst. Ignored, excuse me, ignored at best and dehumanized uh, at worst. And what do I mean by both? When I say ignored, I mean for many, we are invisible. We don't exist. 
Uh, in fact, you see this more evidently in, in, in Christian pilgrims who visit the land. They hardly ever visit us. Uh, and there is a wall, and we're shielded inside the wall. We don't exist. It's very comfortable. You come and see the holy sites, uh, and that's it. But it's much, much deeper uh, than that. Uh, we've always, quote unquote, did not exist. Uh, when Zionism was you know, founded, they used the slogan, a land without a people for a people without a land. I'm sure you've heard this many times uh, before. Uh, whenever I read this, I've always wondered, but did they know that the land had people? Uh, and I'm not now talking about the Zionist movement. I want to address more directly Christians who use that slogan because Christians have used the slogan before the Zionist movement. Uh, and it's documented. Uh, when they talked about uh, our land as a, a country without a nation for a nation without a country because they, they didn't want Jews among them in Europe, so they said, let's shift them to Palestine, be the second coming, and so on. And again, I wonder, when they used that slogan, did they know that our land has people? And when it comes to the British Empire, uh, more directly, who British theologians use that, not only did they know that the land had people, they knew exactly how many individuals lived there because they occupied us. The British mandate was there. Uh, and they would do census. But they still spoke about our land as uh, a land without people. Uh, and what I want to say is that they weren't talking literally as a land without people. Uh, because for them, uh, they wanted to solve the problem of Jews in their midst, the so-called, uh, as they framed it, the Jewish problem, uh, because they didn't want Jews in their midst, as I said. Uh, so to solve this, the Palestinian Arabs were a complete irrelevance. Uh, ben White says, for the Zionists, Palestine was empty, not literally, but in terms of people of equal worth to the incoming settlers. Think of that. This is a typical colonial mentality. Dare I say a typical colonial Christian mentality in which we think, yes, the land had people, but hey, it can be moved. They're not like us. They can be shifted. And you think that this change, sadly it didn't. Just one example is enough. Uh, from a debate in 2012 by two Christian leaders here in the United States, uh, this is nothing personal against any of them, but the discussion was, do Jews have a divine right to Israel's land? This is Christianity Today, probably the most read Christian website. Do Jews have a divine right to Israel's land? Uh, and whenever I read this, again, try to imagine how Palestinians react to such a statement such a discussion. And by the way, what's there to discuss because they've already called it Israel's land. Did you notice that? So what's there to debate? Uh, and second, the, the language of divine right. Again, because if the answer is yes, Jews have a divine right to the land, that where does that leave me as a Palestinian? Can I object? Can I say anything? Because if I object, I would be objecting against God. And by the way, we go crazy when Muslims use this language, but here we have no problem applying it to Israel, the language of divine right. And on top of that, again, let me be sorry to be very honest. The problem with such a debate is that, what about the Palestinians? What about our perspective? Does it matter? Uh, and here you have a classic case of two American theologians, dare I say two white American theologians, sitting in the comfort of their offices, discussing our land as if it's empty. And this is the problem. And when they produce theology, it's orthodoxy, it's dogma. But when we speak as Palestinians, oh, it's a Palestinian perspective. What do they know? It has to come from our academic institutes in order for it to be a legit uh, theology. In this sense, again, we are being ignored, uh, even dehumanized. Ignored is one thing, but in other circles, we are even, as I said, uh, dehumanized. And what do I mean by that? Uh, this is a quote from Mike Pence's visit to the Knesset. We stand with Israel because your cause is our cause, this is as he's saying. Your values are our values, and your fight is our fight. We stand with Israel because we believe in right over wrong, in good over evil, and in liberty over tyranny. Think for a moment, who is the tyranny? Who is the evil? Who is the wrong in all of these statements? 
see what's happening here where an entire nation just like this is dehumanized uh, in, in such a statement. And many Christians do this. Uh, in fact, let me bring it more to home and speak about Christ at the checkpoint. Uh, this is what has been told about or what has been written about Christ at the checkpoint. Simply for daring to challenge not just political but mainly theological Muslimat, uh, theological beliefs and dogmas that many Christians held. And all of us, we challenge that. They say, wait a minute, we have a different opinion. Uh, and we have a different experience as Palestinian Christians. And we were called all sorts of things from invented to anti-Semitic to socialist to theological terrorism to anti-Jewish to... And I stopped looking at... Uh, it's, it's been a long time since I've monitored what's written. But this is how Christians relate to us when we speak. And it's classic character assassination. Rather than dealing with our arguments or even, you know, showing some sympathy, immediately you, you assassinate the character. Don't listen to Palestinian uh, Christians. And it makes me wonder, why are we being silenced? And if you think I am uh, imagining this or trying to have a victim mentality about being silenced, uh, most Palestinian Christian leaders here in this room talk to them about their experience of being invited to a conference and then being disinvited. I see many uh, shaking their heads. Uh, it happens. It happens many times. You are invited, and just like that, you are disinvited. There is pressure. And just to give you sometimes the logic behind, uh, behind that, there was a few years ago a Christian conference in a Lutheran seminary, and I'm ashamed by this as a Lutheran, on Palestine and, and Israel, and there was no Palestinian speaker in the conference. Mubarak was invited, and then he was pressure. We cannot have him. He has radical views, and all of a sudden, you're disinvited. Uh, Alex has similar experiences uh, as well. And here is the thing, and I want to say just one story that highlights the problem here. Because if you think it's about their views, think again. Uh, 2013, I was invited to a mission conference in Ireland, a mission conference. Um, and then I received an email saying there is a big pressure, so much pressure on us to disinvite you, but we will invite you regardless. Uh, we just want you to know about this from us. Uh, and I said, okay. Uh, and at the beginning, I was a bit intrigued. I thought, wow, I'm already famous. So I said, uh, is this something I said? Do they, you know, maybe I can respond. And he said, oh, no, they don't know you. It's because you're a Palestinian. It's a mission conference where the nationality of the speaker is a problem. Uh, this year also, I was, an invitation to me was withdrawn from speaking to a huge uh, mission conference in the United States to thousands of students. And that the invitation was uh, withdrawn. They said, we cannot handle uh, the issue. And I was supposed to lead the Bible studies, not even talk about Palestine and Israel. But my nationality uh, is the problem. Or maybe it's not just the nationality, but your views. Uh, it makes me wonder what's being communicated here. I always laugh, you know, the message is God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jack mentions this, but maybe what you don't see is a footnote on top of the world, uh, world uh, which says, except with the exception of Palestinians, unless they conform to Western Christian worldviews on Israel. This is the message. You see what's happening? And we see this, by the way, in many circles, when they have conferences on Israel, but because they want to look good in, in the eyes of the hearers, they, they want to invite a Palestinian. They look for one Palestinian or two who confer or agree with Christian Zionism and invite them. Okay? Uh, uh, and what, what happens here is that, again, uh, the message is that uh, Christian leaders who all speak in one voice, um, uh, we don't want to listen to you because you do not conform with our theological and political... Uh, well, we, we only want to hear, we prefer to hear what we want you to, you know, uh, certain things. So if you speak these things, we'll invite you. Even if it means looking for someone who doesn't represent anybody, who will say what they want to hear and they will invite him uh, or her. And what's this telling us as Christian leaders, pastors, uh, theologians, is that you actually do not know what you're talking about. We know who's talking. We know someone who knows uh, better than you. You're deceived, or you're not genuine, uh, or you're afraid, as this is what some told us. Uh, but we know who's not afraid, and we will bring him 
uh, or her, or even worse, we know better. One of the things, those who know me know, one of the things that really drive me crazy, and I don't, I'm, I'm typically a calm person, by the way, uh, is when people come from outside and want to debate me about politics and about what's happening in Palestine and Israel. You don't know, you see, and, and they try to tell us to explain the city. Well, we live there, we know what's happening, what are you saying? You see what's happening, because we want to educate you. And if we find someone who says what we want them to say, we'll invite them. But we don't want to invite those who represent uh, uh, the majority of Palestinian uh, Christians. Uh, many times we're being accused of not being silenced. Uh, Reverend Jack addressed this yesterday. And I want to say not only we're not, you know, we're Palestinians, we're speaking about our experience. But at the same time, again, how do I speak about uh, the issue I mentioned, the family reunification issue, why being balanced? I'll do it, tell me. What's the other side of the story? Uh, Palestinians, I cannot bring my relatives to come live with us. I have a, an aunt and an uncle who live in, in, uh, in Egypt and Lebanon. They cannot come and visit because when Israel became a state, they were outside studying. Uh, but if any one of you can prove that you have a Jewish line in your uh, blood, you're welcome to come and you have more rights than us. What's the other side of the story? What's the balanced way of telling such a story? What's the balanced way of telling about the unequal distribution uh, of water, uh, this issue uh, of balance? What's the other story of being humiliated at a checkpoint, knowing that it's not there for security because they don't search you, they just humiliate you? Again, what's the other side? And I'll, I'll say it. And so on that, we are being silenced. We are being silenced. And I believe we are being silenced because we break the stereotype. A stereotype that is preferred by uh, many who like to, as I said, polarize the world into a clash between two worldviews, uh, two civilization. This is the common narrative, black and white, evil and good, the axis of evil and the axis of good, if you wish. Uh, but here we come. Uh, we are Palestinians, but we are not Muslims. Uh, many prefer to have this conflict as a conflict between the Judeo-Christian tradition from one side and Islamic terrorism. And as I said, uh, we disturb that image because we're Palestinians, yet we're not, we're not Muslims. And we insist that the conflict is political. Uh, yes, religious extremism is a challenge to all of us, not just Islamic, Christian, and Jewish. All religious extremism is a challenge. But in Palestine and Israel, the occupation is the core uh, issue. Uh, and many times we are being silenced because we point out to privilege and to Islamophobia in many uh, Christian circles, uh, and because we su suffer them from this simply for being uh, Palestinians. And I believe this is why we are, in many circles, being silenced. Today, um, we want to... Um, uh, when you read for Palestinian Christians, as I said, you will see that we are speaking directly to Christians. In, and we have an issue with that theology. We have an issue. Uh, we have several issues. Issues related to justice. What about justice? Does it matter? What about us as Palestinians? You believe the land belongs to the Jewish people by divine right. What should we do? Should we leave? Is this what you're promoting? Uh, what about the occupation? Can we continue with the current uh, status quo? What about the international uh, law, uh, all of that uh, issues? For us Palestinian Christians, we are clear, and let me quote Kairos, the Israeli occupation to Palestinian land is a sin against God and humanity because it deprives the Palestinians of their basic rights bestowed by God, and it also distorts the image of God in both the Palestinian and uh, the Israeli. It is a challenge, and we want to say, let's deal with these issues. Uh, we also have theological challenges, questions about the promised land. What is the promised land? By the way, quickly speaking, did you know that in the Bible, the promised land is more than just Palestine and Israel? It's from the river to the river. And so I always joke to Christian Zionists, at least be consistent. Because if you believe this, then you should call for Israel to occupy Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Or don't use the Bible, because that's the promised land. See that the logic? Uh, in addition, who are the people of God in the Bible? Is it by ethnicity? And please pause before you answer, because if you say yes, you make God a racist. Is it by ethnicity? Is, is the people of God divine? But the promises, were they conditional or on? In other words, we have a serious challenge with the theology of Christian Zionism, and we have written much about that. And I always tell uh, 
Christian Zionists. I hope people debate us with the content of these books rather than assassinate our character. We've worked hard, we studied the Bible to bring uh, answers uh, about these uh, issues. We don't have time to go through this. In our manifesto, Christ at the Checkpoint, manifesto we say uh, racial ethnicity alone does not guarantee the benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. This is at least how we read the Bible. In addition, uh, we say and insist that any exclusive claim uh, to the land of the Bible in the name of God is not in line with the teaching of Scripture. Uh, this is what we believe uh, in. Uh, quickly speaking, so you might wonder, so what, do you, what are you saying then about Israel as a state and about the church and the Jewish uh, people? Uh, and again, because we don't have time, let me be very quick about this. When it comes to the state of Israel, is it too much to ask as Palestinian Christians that we relate to Israel based on the international law? Is it too much to ask to relate to Israel as a secular state, as a normal state? What we have a problem with is the language of divine right the language of fulfillment of prophecy, because we have seen this over and over used against us and against our friends to keep a silence over the injustices that we face as people uh, and that many Palestinians uh, around the world are facing. Is it too much to ask um, when it comes to the state uh, of Israel? Uh, and I say this because we continue to see again and again the Bible used to justify political positions. Uh, just one example, and I have written a lot about the use of the Bible in Israeli politics and uh, in American evangelical politics. Uh, here we have the Israeli ambassador in the UN defending Israel's right to build settlements on Palestinian land holding a Bible. Just think of that. And let me respond by, again, using the word of Kairos. Therefore, we declare that any use of the Bible to legitimize or support political options and positions that are based upon injustice imposed by one person on another, or by one people on another, transform religion into human ideology and strip the word of God of its holiness, of its universality, and its truth. At the same time, when it comes to the Jewish people, many write books about theology of the Jewish people, the church and Israel, and say, why do we need this? For me, it's very simple. When it comes to any people, the Bible is clear. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why can't we just take this and live with it? Why do we have to write book about the fate of the Jewish people, the relationship between the church uh, and Israel, and then relate to Israel based on these uh, books? I always say, let's look at the Jewish people as people of faith. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself should be the lens, should be the guidelines for us to relate to any people, not just uh, the Jewish people. And at the same time, when it comes to us as Palestinians, I love what Kairos says about uh, this, this concept. Love is seeing the face of God in every human being. Every person is my brother or my sister. However, seeing the face of God in everyone does not mean accepting evil or aggression on their part. Rather, this love seeks to correct the evil and stop the aggression. And we will continue uh, to do this. And so let me now speak to those of you, those of us who are meeting here, our message is it's time to take Jesus' commandments about blessed are the peacemakers. It's time to take this more seriously. And it's time for the church to become part of the solution rather than being part of the problem in Palestine and Israel. Uh, when Jesus said blessed are the peacemaker, I all, did he really mean it? Do we take him seriously enough? And keep in mind, he didn't say, uh, when your neighbor is fighting, go and uh, your two neighbors tap on their shoulder and tell them to get along. He said this in a politically charged environment. He knew what he was saying. But do we take him seriously? And more important, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. We forget this. We prefer a formula which tells us, if you raise your hand to a preacher, you are a child of God. But we forget that being a child of God involves good, you know, uh, serious work and trying to reconcile the people of God uh, everywhere. But again, do we take him uh, seriously? Justice matters. It matters a lot to God and it should matter to us. Uh, and I've always said, if our theology trumps the biblical ethical teachings of Jesus, of love, equality, and justice, then we must rethink this theology. If our theology 
produces privilege between or, uh, or two plans. We must we have a problem. If, if our theology discriminates between people, I have a problem with that theology. Justice matters to God. It's in the Bible. Justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. I believe this applied in biblical times. I please it applies today, and I believe this applies to any land, not just to our land. If there is no justice even here in Oklahoma, believe me, there is no future for that community or society. Justice matters to God. I think we should take this uh, seriously. And as such, we are troubled today as Christians around the world. And here, not just, I don't only speak, by the way, on our experience as Palestinian Christians. Many of us, when we look at the way the church is behaving, especially today, uh, I do not even recognize the Christ-like element in many circles, certainly in the evangelical Christianity, a Christianity that celebrates numbers, expansion, wealth, growth, and prosperity. War is celebrated and encouraged. Pastors are celebrities. Uh, they want influence. They want to be bestsellers. They want uh, the biggest church. They want power. Uh, it is hard to tell the difference between church and empire today. And we need to be careful about what's happening in our uh, churches. A quote from Randall Palmer, America's evangelicals have become more interested in the pursuit of wealth and political influence than fidelity to the teachings uh, of Jesus. The church wants to be powerful. And I think we need to wake up to what's happening in our circles today. And at the same time, enough this obsession about prophecy and about end time. Uh, one of the tragedies, I say, the sad realities about Christendom in the second part of the 20th century is the fact that this book sold more than 65 million copies. Think of that, 65 million copies for a book about end times. Try to write a book about serving the poor or for justice. You might not sell 65 copies. But this is the reality uh, today uh, of the church. In conclusion, and I'm running out of time, do I see hope? for the future? Is there hope? Can we dare to hope? Um, we were just talking about the next crisis at the checkpoint, and we decided to talk about resilience, because we, are, we need to be resilient, and we are resilient these days. And yes, we dare to hope. And I find hope, despite everything I have written, and I want to challenge you today to share with me with this hope and with the dream. I find hope because God is just. God is good and he is just. And as is often said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Amen to that. Second, I have hope because we live in the land of hope, the land of the resurrection. The empty tomb reminds us that we can continue to hope. Friday, yes, might last long, but we are sure that Sunday will come one day. We cannot lose hope as Christians. So no, we're not giving up. We are resilient. And at the same time, I'm hopeful because there are good people on both sides. There are Palestinians of, and Israelis who are giving, dedicating their lives for the cause of peace. Muslims, Christians, and Jews dedicating their lives to the cause of peace. And I see hope in that. And we shouldn't just look at the negatives. Uh, and there are, even in the church today, prophetic voices. Uh, and uh, I, I love what uh, Reverend Mitri Rahib always says. We have hope, but at the same time, hope is what we do. Hope is the uh, reality we create. And I want to invite you to help us create uh, this hope as a church. And I've called me naive, but I believe that we as a church worldwide, uh, we can make uh, a difference. So I have hope, but at the same time, I believe we need to think in new ways. Uh, we need to have a new vision, and we need to dare not just to hope, but dare to dream of a better uh, tomorrow. Uh, in my book, I talk about sharing the land, sharing the land. We need to begin thinking of that. Uh, this should be our motto, that the land belongs to God, not to any nation or religion or ethnicity. At the same time, we all belong to the land, God's land. I always tell my students, you don't need a PhD in Oxford to figure this out. The answer to whom does the land belong? It belongs to God. The Bible is clear. No one can claim possession of any land. And because it is God's land, we have to learn how to share the land. And this is, by the way, very different from dividing the land in which we say, this is your part and this is your part. This is my part. And I don't want anything to do with you. Let's separate. This is not what we need to talk about. 
And sadly, this is the common narrative today. Uh, all the dwellers of the land in this vision should share the land and its resources equally and have the same rights, regardless of their ethnicity or religion. I believe that a shared land theology uh, emphasizes that our, there are no second class citizens in this land. No one is marginalized in God's vision of the land. Today, the reality on the ground is that of walls. Yet what is needed is bridges. And we need brave people who dare to build these bridges. I believe that Palestinians and Israelis must think collectively in terms of a common future in which they cooperate, not a divided future in which they separate. And we need to have this vision. We need to prophetically declare it. Uh, and regardless, by the way, of which political solution is adopted and implemented, these vision of ideals of God, of justice and equality, uh, need to be respected. And this should be the guiding principle for us as people of faith, this idea of sharing uh, the land. An idea in which we, as the Nassar family puts on the entrance of their land, we refuse to be enemies, where we treat everyone as a neighbor. I want to quote Cairo's document again. Through our love, we will overcome injustice and establish foundations for a new society, both for us and for our opponents. Our future and their future are one. We must be convinced of that. Either the cycle of violence that destroys both of us or peace that will benefit uh, both. Uh, even though we have fought one another in the recent past and still struggle today, we are able to love and live together. We can organize our political life with all its complexity according to the logic of this love and its power after ending the occupation and establishing justice. So let's have this vision. Let, let's allow this vision to guide us. But let's remember, we need to end the occupation first. And then together, we can plan and build for a better future. And I hope that the church captures this vision and is energized by such uh, a vision. I believe that this is not simply one option forward. I believe this is the only option forward for us to change the land. And I want now to challenge all of us. Uh, I want to challenge the Church of Christ. Does our theology promote this? Too often it didn't. We talked about the land belongs to this or to that. We need to revisit our theology books. Do our prayers communicate this or promote this idea? I met once a woman, uh, an elderly woman, who told me that for 50 years she prayed for the peace of Jerusalem. 50 years she prayed every day for the peace of Jerusalem. And she said, I've never prayed for Palestinians. But I will begin now after meeting. And think of that. Well, even the way we pray uh, matters. And do our actions uh, promote this? And this is, again, a very important concept. Do our action promote this vision of a shared uh, land? And one of the things where this is very visible is the way many Christians do pilgrimage. We're very little, not just only devoted to peacemaking, very little is devoted to even meeting the living stones. We want to walk where Jesus walked. We end up running where Jesus walked because we're always in a hurry. Uh, and at, the, at best, uh, the majority of pilgrims, Christian pilgrims, spend at best two hours in Bethlehem. Think of that. And you make, wow, why, is, why, why are Christians, do they care about the situation? Uh, and, and is this really how we walk in Jesus' footsteps? By visiting old sites. We walk in Jesus' footsteps when we care for justice, when we meet people, when we meet the oppressed and give them time and love and support. Isn't this what Jesus did when he walked in our land? And this is what we should do if we really want to walk in Jesus' footsteps. Uh, Christian attitudes toward our land many times remind me of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, where, you know, two religious people walked by a wounded person who needed help. And what did they do? They did nothing. I always joke they were probably on their way to a Christian conference. <laughs> a conference maybe on compassion or worship. They looked at a wounded person and they did nothing. Uh, they did nothing. Just think of that. Uh, it makes you wonder, what happened to us? Um, is this really religiosity? We're coming on a spiritual pilgrimage. And I often wondered, seeing one bus after the other, cross the checkpoint, walk by the wall, walk by the two refugee camps, I always wondered, do those people care? Do people care about our situation? They want to do a religious duty, two hours, visit Bethlehem, pray where Jesus was born, and leave. Uh, it makes me wonder, 
what happened to us? At best, we get a comment, it's unfortunate what's happening here. It's complicated. Uh, what happened to, to God's call for uh, compassion? Christian attitudes also to, towards our land are summarized by this quote I've heard so many times from Christians who come and visit and debate, of course, politics and end up saying, well, it's complicated and we know that there will never be peace in the Holy Land until Christ returns. Have you heard something like that before? And I must admit that as a child, I loved that answer because it made Jesus look like this superhero who will come and rescue us. Amazing, right? But then you read Jesus and you discover he has a different agenda, something called kingdom that he wants us to be part in. And after reading Jesus and understanding the gospel and his call, uh, I no longer actually believe in this. And I, let me put it in a way that might sound heretical to some. I no longer wait for divine intervention because I believe God calls us to action. So rather than waiting, let's get busy uh, in our uh, activity. Rather than debating to whom does the land belong, imagine if Christians invested time, energy, prayer, efforts, and even money in trying to answer such a questions. How can we as Christians advance peace between Israelis and Palestinians? Imagine if these millions of dollars invested in settlements are invested in initiatives that try to answer such a question. Imagine if those praying for the peace of Jerusalem would pray for peace between Palestinians and Israelis. I believe we could have made a difference. So rather than waiting for divine intervention, let's get busy. Let's get busy. And I will conclude with a quote by uh, Reverend Mitri Rahib, a Palestinian pastor and theologian. Christians need no longer wait for direct divine intervention because the intervention has already taken place. The Messiah has come. And there is no need to wait for another. He said what needed to be said. And he did what needed to be done. God did his part. The ball now is in the court of humankind. The transformed faithful are to engage the world, challenge the monopoly of power, and live the life of an already liberated people. Friends, sisters, and brothers, the ball now is in our court. What shall we do about this? Thank you.